okay, Lord, if they're right behind me, okay, all right, if they touch that, okay, okay, if, if, if I go through the doorway and they go through the doorway at the same time, then I've done that. I can't even count how many times. You know what's the weirdest thing? They always do it. I don't know what that is about. I'm just going to start asking the Lord weird stuff. Okay, Lord, if they give me $100, then I will pray for them. Oh, brother, I just had a <laughs> Yesterday, Kaylee and I, we had a cool testimony. Lupe, Martine's mom, one of our kids, we were doing tutoring. She came and dropped Martine off, and I had seen on Facebook that she had fallen and hurt her arm. And it was actually her shoulder, uh, come to find out. But um, when she came in, I said, hey, how's your arm? And she goes, how do you know about that? I was like, oh, it's Facebook. And uh, she says, it still hurts. She goes, and she went, I could only lift it like this. She, I, I, that's as far as I could lift it. And uh, I went to the hospital, and there's nothing they can do about it. And they, and they uh, this is like kind of a long story. Uh, to make a long story short, we say, hey, can we pray for you? Uh, we we're just at church Sunday. People were getting healed. Lord's gonna, Lord wants to heal you. So we prayed for her. First time we prayed for her. We said, uh, we got done praying. We said, do something you couldn't do before. So she went this far. She goes, oh, oh, okay, it hurt. I mean, it's better. I couldn't go this far, but it's better. I said, well, let's pray again. Sometimes it takes two or three times. A lot of times on the second or third prayer, people get the breakthrough. So we prayed again. She lifts up her arm, and she goes, oh, oh, that's good. I, I mean, I'm up this high, but, you know, that's good. Thank you. I said, no, one more time. Just give me one more time, and uh, after that, you're free to go. And so we prayed for her one last time, and we prayed for her one last time. She got full range of motion. And she, and she got full range of motion, so she's moving her arm, and she goes, oh, but there's still a little pain. But I was like, so I started saying, you know, sometimes that pain just starts to go away as we thank him. And so I'm, like, having a conversation with her, teaching her what to do, but she's not doing any <laughs> of it. She's, like, talking, like, oh, it's just a little. And as she's doing it, all of a sudden, she's just do, she starts fixing her hair, and she's, like, almost unconscious that she's even using her arm. She goes, oh my gosh, I'm, she's like, oh my gosh, I'm using my arm. I, I didn't even realize that I'm using my arm. And so anyways, so, so the Lord heals her and uh, she started crying. And uh, so she just started crying under the love of God. We're like, oh, the Lord loves you so much. And anyway, she got touched by Jesus and it was just a cool testimony. She was in the car uh, picking up Martine and she, she waves to us with her uh, arm that wasn't hurt. And then she goes, and then she picked it up just to show us. And she's like, she's forget, she's been, it's been a couple of weeks now that she's had the injured arm. So, you know, when you injure something, you're so used to not using it. You have to remind yourself it works. And you're like, anyways, it was just cool to see the Lord touch her and, and, and for her to cry. And just, I just love it, you know, for, for the Lord to manifest his kingdom. And so that was really fun. And mom, don't feel any pressure. I w this is actually something I've been wanting to, uh, to, to talk about. Sometimes we feel the pressure when we pray for somebody that we have to give them the whole gospel message. And, and, and in my opinion, I really feel like sometimes that cheapens uh, the experience. Like you pray for somebody and they get healed and then you're like, you got 15 minutes? <laughs> now that you've been healed, uh, do you have 15 minutes? Because I would like to talk to you about what happened in Genesis. There was a great fall. And, you know, like, it tried to go through the whole gospel, and then it's like, the person's like, kind of, it just cheapens it. It kind of steals the moment sometimes. And I'm not saying that there's never a time. There are some times where that just opens up, and they are ready for the gospel. Who do you serve? How did that happen? But there's other times where you just plant a little seed. One man plants, another waters, but God gives the increase. And sometimes we feel so guilty, like when we give like a little word, just an encouraging word to somebody, that could just be a little plant, just a little seed that we sow. And Paul says that it's not about, he says the sower, the guy that plants and the guy that waters, they get the same reward because it's God that gives the increase. He says, so they're the same. So we don't have to feel pressure to every time we bump into somebody at, the, at Walmart and, and we give them either a prophetic word or a word of knowledge or something that we have to tell it with a paragraph of, of, of the gospel. Sometimes, and, and sometimes that's not even uh, the case. It's not a possibility. I've been in drive throughs giving a word of knowledge and be like, I hope that makes sense. Oh yeah, it does. All right, thank you. Give you, and you, and you go. But I don't have to feel pressure that, oh, she doesn't even know that all are under the, the curse of sin and that she, 
I just planted a seed. And I believe that the Lord who gives the increase is going to send somebody to water that seed. And so all we have to do is be obedient. That's really what it comes down to. Be obedient as sons and daughters of God and not feel so much pressure all the time to, oh, I should have gave them the entire gospel when that might not have been an opportunity to or practical. And sowing seed is just as important as watering it and nurturing it, but God's going to give the increase. So I just kind of want to put that out there just to free us because sometimes I know myself, I've been kind of under that condemnation, like, oh, man, I should have. But don't feel pressured. Just plant. Just sow that little seed of the gospel of the kingdom. Just something little. Because I just don't want it to be cheapened like in our lives when we pray for somebody and they get healed. And it's like, oh, okay, now I know why you prayed for me. Now you want me to listen to your gospel. Like a multi-level marketing scheme. What if we give them Jesus and they walk away and all they can think about is who healed them. Oh my gosh, Jesus just healed me. I cannot, but he just healed me. I was sick, now I'm not. He just healed me. And I believe the Lord can take it from there. I want to talk a little bit about just a couple of things that I feel like is going on. And I've spoke to my dad today and, and I, I just feel like we're in a, in a season where things are changing. Things are kind of shifting. I feel like there's promotion and, and there's a rearranging that's going to be happening even on these Thursday nights. One of the things that we really want to begin to put our focus on is the Ethnos Ministry Training School, which we want to launch next year. I don't know about you guys, but especially when we just had our camp over the summer, I saw just with fresh eyes such a great need for an Ethnos Ministry Training School. I am so tired of year after year, campers coming, getting encountered by God and their fiery prophets for a month. And then as they're in their atmosphere of their schools and of whatever, you, be, you could just watch their Facebook statuses because it's like after camp, everybody's like, friend request, friend request, friend request. And everybody's Facebook statuses are like, glory to God, we're going to shake the world. Camp was awesome. I had a vision. And just really cool stuff for like a month. And then after, then you don't start to see that stuff. And then you start to say, anybody hear that new Drake album? And then you start to see just like wackier and wackier and wackier stuff. And it kills me. I mean, I read it at home and it grieves me. It just kills me. And I feel the burden of the Lord. We have to have a place where people come not for just a weekend, but they come for a couple of years to an ethnos ministry training school. And it's not like all the time they go to ethnos ministry training school and we just send them out. You're on your own. Two years is up. You're out of here. What, we, what we're trying to do is like with dough, and you add a little bit more dough, and then you add a little bit more dough, there's going to be a lot of them that come, and they're going to stay for a decade, a couple decades, five years, four years, three years. Some will stay two years and go right off into the mission field. But what we want is for, uh, to have an eagle's nest. To have an eagle's nest where the young eagles can come, where they can be nurtured, and from the eagle's nest, they can begin to soar and eat serpents. We want to have a community of prayer where they can come and be a part of, and they can begin to get the DNA of heaven because they sit before the throne all the time. And that culture is normal. What we, as a staff, we're already forerunning this, and we're beginning to do this where we have to begin to create the culture, and this is, it's already happening now, but we are creating the culture of prayer and sitting before his presence, a value of his face, a value of his heart, of what he feels, a value for his voice, a value for coming to the house of prayer, of diligence, of living this life even when it's hard, even when you don't feel like it, of walking the narrow road when nobody's watching. All these things, we're building this into our culture so that when they come into it, they get swept up into it. We're creating an air current. When they, that's how eagles fly. They soar super high because they spread their wings and they look for air currents. And the air pockets, the upward drafts, they don't even flap their wings. They just have them open because they're catching the air. And they, soup, they, they soar super high in the heavens. And I feel like that's what the Lord's doing with us, that he's creating an air current amongst us so that all the little eagles have to do is spread their little wings and they get to fly. 
you know, that was the prophetic word that Jeremy Nelson gave us years ago when we talked about starting the ministry training school. He said, I see the Lord's going to start at Eagle's Nest, and I see young eagles. They're going to grow up to be big eagles, and they fly down, and they eat serpents. And I do want to say that it's not a staff thing. So if you're not on staff, don't be like, oh, man, you guys are so lucky. It has to be a community thing. They have to come into a community, not into, okay, there's some, a bunch of staff that teach us and we get to hang out with. No, we need a community. We need a community of believers that lives together, that works together. We need old people. We need young people. We need middle-aged. We need all these things. We need an entire group effort to create this eagle's nest in that upward draft. But the key is all of us have to be doing it. We can't wait till September next year comes and be like, man, let's get fired up. All these young people are going to be looking at us. You know? Like, man, I'm going to read my Bible a lot because all these young people, I'm going to have something cool to say to them. We're creating that culture right now. But honestly, uh, if you're like me, I, I've just been kind of looking what the Lord has for us and just dreaming, and I think about the ministry training school and what the implications are of a ministry training school. Because it's not just class a couple times a day. We're talking about international missions trips. We're talking about going to different churches with revival teams, visiting youth groups and blowing them up uh, with our students, our students just releasing their testimonies. We're talking about uh, them being involved on, on the missions uh, aspect of what we do on the west side, them being involved in the house of prayer, they're going to come with a lot of demons that need to be cast out. They're going to come with a lot of baggage and a lot of problems and a lot of issues that need to be counseled. They're going to come with uh, some stuff where they just need to be fathered, fathered and mothered through a whole lot of issues. And there's going to be a lot of them that are going to have heads this big, but th hearts this big. They're going to be so full of religious knowledge and uh, what well, my pastor said and uh, yeah, I wear a prayer shawl and they're going to be so pumped up on some of their own stuff just, just by way of zeal of youth. All of us were like that. I mean, I was hardcore like that, just full of zeal and not a lot of maturity or wisdom. And so there's going to be so much to uh, deal with. And then we haven't even gotten into international missions trips and then planting other ministry training schools and houses of prayer. And there's just a lot. There's a whole lot that the Lord has called us to. We haven't talked about the ending of sex trafficking, what our role is in that. I mean, there's just so much that's on our plate. And, uh, you know, for me, I, I feel daunted sometimes when I look at it. When I look at all of it, I, I begin to think, Lord, I, I just, I don't know. I don't know if I'm your guy. You know, sometimes I feel like that. I feel like, I don't know if I'm gifted enough. I don't, I'm not sure if I'm strong enough or if I'm smart enough. I don't know if I have the focus, Lord. I just, I really want to. You know, Lord, I so want to do this. I just don't know. I don't even know if I have the strength to. And those are like real thoughts that cross my head. Of, Lord, I, I really want to do this and raise up those eagles. I want to be an eagle. Lord, I really want sons and daughters, double portion sons and daughters to come out of this house. And I want to be a part of it. I just don't know. And the Lord today just really encouraged me with the word out of Mark. And it's something that's so familiar to us. And it's Mark the sixth chapter. Does anybody sympathize with those feelings when you feel the destiny of the Lord? And um, it, it doesn't even have to be ministry. It could be parenting. It could be, Lord, I don't know if I can be the right parent. I'm not, I'm trying, but I don't know. It could be being a husband. It could be being a wife. It could simply just be, Lord, I want to be that sold out, faithful, radical one that I promised you I would be and that I was kind of like in my youth when I had so much zeal and I had the free time. And, but now I'm married. Now I have kids. Now I've got a house. I've got all these things. Everything is competing for me. I really want to dance the dance, but I just don't know if I can do it anymore. 
I'm just not sure. I'm getting older. I'm getting tired. My time is just dispersed everywhere. That could be the issue for a lot of us. Mark 6 and verse 35. And it's a familiar story of the, the fish and the loaves. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away, that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he, that's Jesus, answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And I feel like this is such a call from the Lord, and I feel a personal thing where I'm like, Lord, there's other prophets out there and apostles and evangelists and teachers. There's ministries out there. And there's a lot of other smart people that that can do this. But the Lord says to you, no, I want you to do this. You give them something to eat. He places the responsibility on the disciples. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. And then he commanded them and he said, and he, and he said to them, make them all sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish... He looked up to heaven, blessed it, broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate, and they were filled. I feel like us as a ministry and us as individuals are really like the, the broke Apostles that all they had was five loaves of bread and two fish, but there's like 4,000 men plus women and children to feed. The truth is we just, we don't have enough to get the job done. None of us are gifted enough to get the job done. None of us have the right attributes to get the job done. None of us are strong enough to get the job done. And for me, I'm just revisiting to the Lord. And the Lord, all he's saying is, whatever you have, give it to me. The Lord wasn't like, what, you got five loaves? That's never going to work. He says, well, if all you have is five loaves and two fish, give it all to me. And when the disciples gave all of it to him, it was enough. He made it enough. He lifts it up to heaven before the Father, and the Father blesses it. If we give everything we have to the Lord, the Lord can offer it to the Father. The Father blesses it and multiplies it and makes it enough. And it's kind of like that toothpaste speech I gave a while ago. You remember the magical toothpaste when you're down to like, there's barely any toothpaste in the tube, but somehow, day after day, more toothpaste keeps coming out. You twist it, you turn it, you roll it, you cut it, you do all types of things and you are just impressed and astonished by how much more toothpaste was in there when you thought there was barely any. And I believe there's more in us to give than we have originally thought. And yesterday was such an awesome prayer time in the evening. We had such an awesome time and it was It was so special to give ourselves to the Lord. And from some of the prayers that I was hearing, I'm I'm hearing that the Lord's speaking this to several of us. That there's several of us that have been looking back to the days of our youth and saying, Lord, I want the days of abandonment, but I don't know. I don't know. I am trying. I want the zeal of first love. I want to go all out like I used to. I want to pray like I used to pray. I just, I don't know if I even have it in me anymore. I don't know if I have the strength, that same zeal. And the Lord is calling us to squeeze that toothpaste because there's a little bit more. 
He's not looking for us to muster up our own strength. He's just looking for us to give that little bit more to where everything we have is given to him. And when everything's given to him, he'll make it work. And so in my own life, you know, over the past few nights, I've, you know, just been before the Lord in bed, laying next to Kaylee, just meditating before the Lord. And over the past few nights, I've been thinking night after night, what if I had three months to live? What if the Lord came to you and said, son, daughter, you've got three months to live? Three months, and then you come home. How do you live? How do you live when you have three months left and you're in eternity? Three more months, and you have to stand before the throne. Three more months, and all you've done in this life is over, and only what's done for God lasts. And so I just began to, and I was talking to Kaylee about it last night, but over these past few nights, I began to think, what would I, how would I live my life if I had three months to live? Every offense in my heart would be gone. I'd have no time for it. How would you live if you had three months to live? Some of the petty offenses that you've held on to, some of the issues that you've had with friends and, and uh, fellow believers, you think you would still hold on to those if you had three months and then you stand before the Lord? What about some of our, our, the ways that we spend our time? That has been the thing that's been impressing upon me the most. I would spend my time much different if I had three months to live before the Lord. I've been praying the prayer of David. Teach me to number my days. Little David, that inquisitive little guy before the Lord. God, teach me to number my days. Why? He doesn't want to live in regret. Teach me the sum of my days. It's David that says that we're like grass that appears for a little time. The flower blooms, the wind blows, and it's gone. And its place remembers it no more. There is, when I begin to think, I've got, if I had three months to live, you know, I, I sometimes, you know, I feel like, oh, I'm going pretty hard for the Lord and I'm going after it. But when I begin to put it in perspective, okay, if I had three months to live, I saw how much more is in me that I could give. That there is so much more on the inside that I could be giving that I'm not. How would you love your spouse if you had three months to live? I mean, I started crying, like, looking at Kaylee last night, like, oh, like, if I had three months, only three months left to be married to her. Like, I was so, like, oh. How would you treat your spouse? You think some of your petty arguments and the baggage that you have in your relationship, you think you'd hold on to it if you had three months to live? Why waste the time, right? If you've got three months to live, love them with all you've got. Give everything. I told Kaylee, if I had three months to live, I'd be a fountain of love. I'd love every person that comes in front of me. I'd give the gospel to everybody. So the question is, if I'd live like that for three months, if I, if I had three months to live and I would want to live like that, why wouldn't I purpose in my heart to set my heart to live like that for the very short time on earth that we have? Life is but a vapor. It's so short. We're deceived in thinking that it's long. It's short. People say, you know, 70, 80 years, he lived a long life. 80 years isn't a long time. 80 years isn't a long time in history. 80 years is not a long time compared to eternity. So what I'm saying is that's a great exercise for even you to do. Think about that for the next few nights. If I had three months to live, how would I live my life? What would I do different? What would my, what would my free time look like? I mean, just out of that exercise, I've, my free time looks different. I want to give it to the Lord. I want to give it to getting to know him and to know his heart. I want, to get it, I want to give it to him. I want to give it to my wife. I want to give it to the people that I love. When I encounter people, 
If you had three months to live, when you encounter people, it might be your very last time ever seeing that person. So give them everything you've got. Give them all the love and affection that you have. Hold nothing back. How many times do we see people and we like totally have something nice to say? We just don't say it. Anybody do that? You're like, I could, man, they look really nice today. I just don't feel like saying it. What if we began to live like that? What if we just began to give our all to the Lord and the Lord will make it enough? Later on in, in that same chapter, Jesus tells the apostles, get inside the boat. Go into the boat and then go cross over to Bethsaida. Cross over there because we've got a brand new mission. And we're going to break into that territory with the gospel. And Jesus goes up upon a mountain and he sees them in great distress, which is so awesome. He's on a mountain there in the sea, but Jesus sees them. He's having a, a revelatory experience seeing them in the middle of the ocean or lake, whatever it was. And the winds are contrary. It's blowing up against them. And they feel like they can't make it. But all of a sudden, Jesus begins to come to them in the fourth watch, walking on the sea. And he would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he went into the boat, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves, beyond measure, and marvel. For they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. That is a haunting scripture, the very last. Verse 52 of chapter 6. For they had not understood about the loaves, because their heart was hardened. They didn't understand that class was in, se in session when Jesus performed that miracle. They were totally hardened to it. They didn't understand that the Lord was instructing them and inviting them into his nature, into how he works, and into his ways. So what's the revelation? Their heart was hard. It was hardened to this revelation. It didn't get through to them the first time. And Jesus is proving the exact same revelation the second time when he comes through on the boat. The revelation is, is he, if he gives you a mission, he's going to come through for you and give you grace for you to accomplish that mission. Even if winds are contrary, even if all you have is five loaves and two fish, if you give it your all and you are obedient, he's going to come through and he's going to make it happen himself. The first mission was, Lord, all these people are hungry. We better send them off. Because we don't have any food. And the Lord gives them a mission. You give them something to eat. Oh man, we, we, all we have is five loaves and two fish. What do they do? They give everything to the Lord. And the Lord makes it enough. Second mission. Alright, that's done. Go to Bethsaida. Row the boat over there. I'll meet you. Alright. So they're obedient. And they begin rowing. Even though there's a storm even though the winds are contrary, even though the waves are crashing and they're scared even unto death, they're obedient. And out of their obedience, and because they're obedient, the Lord sees them while he's in prayer on a mountaintop and he comes to them. He comes and he delivers them. And he says that they have little faith and their testimony is weak. They didn't understand the testimony and the lesson from the fish and the loaves from the first place. So what I'm saying is, if the Lord's brought us this far, that's the fish and the loaves. If he's asking us to go to Bethsaida, I'm just going to trust the testimony of the fish and the loaves and believe he's going to bring us the rest of the way. If he fired me up as a young man and I went after him back then and it wasn't my own strength and my own zeal, I'm going to trust that he can take me through and deliver me it until the end. Where I can live before him wholeheartedly, holy, blazing with love, accomplishing the task that he set before us. I'm going to believe I can do that because he brought me when I was a young man. So if the Lord's brought you this far, 
trust the testimony of the fish and the loaves. Even if the wind and the waves and everything is crashing and it looks contrary and it looks like it's not going to happen, go back to the previous testimonies of the breakthrough of the Lord. Their problem was they were hard of heart and they didn't get it. They did not understand about the lows because their heart was hardened. They didn't get the message. Go back to the previous breakthroughs and the faithfulness and visit the faithfulness of the Lord. And it will encourage you and give you faith to trust him even when the winds are contrary this time. If he broke through when there wasn't enough food last time, well, he's going to do it this time because he was teaching me his nature. He was teaching me his ways. He was teaching me what he was like. In another uh, account of the gospel, Jesus rebuked them for their lack of faith. You of little faith. Because they woke him up and said, Lord, aren't you concerned because we're going to die? What was he offended at? He was offended because they didn't believe in his goodness. They refused to believe in who he was. He's like, what you talking about? I don't care if you're going to die. You of little faith, you don't believe me. You don't have faith. You don't believe I'm good. Is there anything more offensive to a parent when their children don't believe they're really good? If their child really doesn't, isn't convinced that they have their best welfare in mind? We have such a great journey ahead of us. Not just this year, but just decades and decades of just a journey. But it's a short time. Life is a vapor. It appears for a little while, and then it is gone. Such a, a short time, this life. We have a short few more decades to live. It seems like the older you get, the faster time goes. I'm still young, but the older I get, the faster I'm like, seasons just begin to pass. It's like winter, spring, summer. Oh my gosh, we're already at fall again. It's winter. And it, it's just like everything just keeps going and going. And you're like, where has time gone? It's just like time just begins to, to, to fade away. And we are truly a vapor. We're like a shadow that appears for a short time. Every time the scripture talks about our life, it talks about it like something fleeting. It says like we're like a, a shadow that appears and it's gone. Like a vapor that appears for a little time and it's gone. Scripture describes our life as a tent that's folded up in the night and then it's gone. So temporal is this life. So eternal is the next life. The next life is so solid, it is so sure, it is so absolute. And only what's done in this life will determine how we live that next life. It will be like waking up from a dream. You know, like inception, minutes count like for years, like inception, the deeper you go into the dream. I mean, it's really like that in the dream world. Most of the time we dream for a couple minutes, but sometimes dreams seem like they last all night. You wake up from a dream, and that dream was so real the night before. In the dream, a whole day passed. Sometimes in, dream, in, in dreams, people can live out weeks. The dream was so short, and you wake to reality. But in the dream, the dream feels so real. I mean, there's super rare occasions where people are like, wait, I'm in a dream. Has anybody ever done that? You're in a dream and you realize you're dreaming and you actually realize you're in a dream. I've done that like once or twice. And I was like, I'm in a dream. What should I do? <laughs> I really did. I was like, I'm in a dream. What should I do? Should I fly? Should I? And I was like, and then I started, I really, I was like, what should I do? I can do anything. I'm in a dream. And I was like, uh-oh, I'm starting to wake up. And I was like waking myself up because I was beginning to have conscious thoughts. I was like, no, I'm in a dream. I was like, I'm in a dream. Which I'm going to fly. I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something else. Oh, I'm waking up. No, 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 no. And I woke up. I didn't get to do anything. I thought I was going to be like, I was like, I'm going to be Iron Man. I'm going to do something. <laughs> like, I didn't know what I was going to do. But that's what this life is like. This life feels so real. 
it feels so sure, it feels so solid at the time. Dreams, they feel so real, so solid at the time. You get shot in a dream, you feel it. Somebody dies in a dream, you weep. Dreams feel so real at the time, and you wake up unto reality. So this life is. This life is like a fleeting dream. It's only a few minutes. It seems like it's like reality, and it's a long time. This life is such a short time. But there's coming a day when we will awake from that dream and we stand before the Lord. The inevitable. All of us are going to die unless the Lord comes. And when we do, that day will be the first time we truly awaken. We awaken to reality. We awaken to the eternal. That which is solid, that which is real, that which is enduring. So the key is, is to live for what's real. Don't live for the dream state. This life is so fleeting. Live for what has eternal consequence and that last. So to sum up, we are going to be doing some changes just in ministry. I mean, nothing big, but I feel like there's going to be promotions and people doing things that they weren't doing before. And you might feel intimidated by that. You might feel like, I'm not the guy. I, I don't, I'm not the girl. I don't... I, that's not my gifting. That's not my talent. I, I don't know if I'm able to do that. That's okay. Just give everything you have to the Lord. Five loaves and two fish is not enough to feed thousands of people. But if you give it to the Lord, he makes it enough. Dig deep. Do that exercise. Think about, I've got three months to live. You're going to see how much you have. If I ask a lot of you, Give more, do more, you know? We can go harder for the gospel. I bet you a lot of people will say, no, I'm already going hard. I mean, I've got kids, I've got a wife. I, you know, I try to wake up when I can. I'm already doing a lot. Okay, well, let me tell you, you've got three months to live. And then you begin to process that. You're going to see you got a ton of time. All of a sudden, those video games you play aren't that interesting. The time on Facebook really doesn't matter anymore the mindless internet surfing that I'm uh, guilty of, of just the zombie internet surfing. You're not even searching for anything. You're just whatever comes up. I'm uh, okay. Oh, wow, that's how many legs a centipede has. Okay, cool. All right. Like just whatever comes up. You're, oh, that's an interesting fact. Like Pinterest. Girls, where are you at? Pinterest is of the devil. I'm just joking. I've been sucked into Pinterest a little bit. I'm like, wow, there is a lot of cool stuff. By association, yes. Now, husbands, how many times has your wife said, come over here, I got to show, come over, babe, look at this. Look at this on Pinterest. You got to, did you see this? Now I'm starting to do it. Like, babe, look at this Mimi somebody wrote. This is awesome. It's so, don't you feel like that? Oh, I love the Willy Wonka ones. Has anybody seen those, the Willy Wonka? And he's got that like really condescending look and he's like this. And he's always saying something condescending. I like the one where he's, uh, there's a one uh, Willy Wonka Mimi, and he says, so you're an atheist. That'll be such a good icebreaker when you meet God. <laughs> I love it. So you're an atheist, you say. That'll be such a good icebreaker when you meet God. I'm like, oh, that was genius. <laughs> what I'm saying is there is so much more to give, and it, it doesn't count if we give a lot of it, if we give half of it. The Lord only wants all of it. That's all that matters to him, is everything. He wants from us what, we, what he's given to us. He's given everything to us. He's held nothing back. The Lord's not like, you better love me. No, he is wanting what all of us want to be loved in the same way we love. If we give our whole selves, we want the person to reciprocate and give all of them. And the Lord's looking for the very same thing. And you have an amazing destiny over your life. 
that far exceeds your abilities and your giftings and your situation and your background. It's so much bigger than all of that. But the Lord says, if you give me enough, I'll make it enough. And I'll give you joy for the journey. John and the worship team, you guys can come up. We're going to just begin to pray. I do want to pray for the ministry training school uh, tonight.